with us. It has been a very hot week, hasn't it? It, will, it was so hot. Say how hot was it? How hot was it? It was so hot that I actually took a picture up here of some bugs that were trying to get in here. It was two or here. It was on the outside of that window and it kept sliding down like this and it go up and slide down. What it is, is it's so It's a hot one out there. You know, 15 weeks from now, we'll be saying, mm, it's cold outside. 15 weeks, that's all. Thank you all. There were two cows out in the pasture. They were out there, and along came a truck, a milk truck that passed it. And on the side of the milk truck were these words, pasteurized, homogenized, standardized. Vitamin A added. One cow side said to the other one, makes you feel kind of inadequate, doesn't it? <laughs> Maybe you feel like four cows a day. Maybe you feel a little inadequate or lack some self-confidence or you don't feel like you have the skills or the abilities that other people do. Well, I'm here to tell you something this morning, and that is this. If you are a Christ follower, if you have invited Christ into your life, friends, there's nothing to be inferior about. You have been chosen by Almighty God. He has a purpose for you in this world, and that makes you somebody in the eyes of God. In the Old Testament, there is a word, anointed. That was used, and when the word was used in the Old Testament, it was a symbolic way to describe someone who was chosen by God. The word was normally used to describe someone who was named either as a king, a prophet, or a priest. And then you look at the New Testament, and the word anointed is described to it is described uh, it describes you. It describes those who are in Christ. You are anointed. Yes, yeah, sermon notes, you're welcome to use them. If they're distracting to you, please place them to the side. But here's what 2 Corinthians says. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 21 and 22 says this. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us. Underline those three words. He anointed us. Set his seal of ownership upon us. And put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. See, there are four specific things here that God has done for us who are believers. And each one of them kind of builds on the other, all connected to this idea of anointing or anointing. Uh, so I want to share what God has done for us. Here's the first one in your sermon notes. God has given me the ability to stand firm. To stand firm. How many runners, or have you ever run marathons or half marathons? I know Don Kill is one. He, he, he doesn't run. Anybody else? John? I have in the past um, run a little bit. It's been a little while since I got a house, but I have done a little bit of running. Runners World in August 1991, old story of Beth Ann DeCanty's uh, attempt to qualify for the 1992 uh, Olympic trial marathon. Uh, if you're going to be a runner, a female runner for a marathon, you have to be able to complete this 26 mile, 385 yard race in less than two hours and 45 minutes to be able to compete for the Olympic trial. Well, Beth was running. She was trying out and a try, and she began to run and she started out really strong. And she started having trouble around mile 23. Now, I just want to pause there, because if you've run long distances, the longest I ever ran was 19 miles. And I don't know how anybody could run more than, I mean, 19, I was done. I remember Mike Horn, as a matter of fact, Mike was here last week. I don't know if you met Mike, Marsha, Maya. They were all here, and I'd run with Mike. We trained for a half marathon. My first half marathon, I ran with him. We made a pact, finished together. And we come at 10 miles, we're running together, and all of a sudden Mike hit a wall. I mean, it was like, I can't, I, can't, I gotta stop, I can't keep going. And I could see it on his face, and I'm like, man, we only got three left, let's go. 
and we made a pact we finished together. I was running backwards, encouraged him, don't give up, we can do this, you can do this. And, and together, we, I ran by him, I ran in front of him, I, said, I kept encouraging him because he hit a wall. He wanted to stop. Now I want you to know, when we got about 10 feet away from the, well, more like 100 yards away, and he started really, I'm there, and he started running, he beat me. <laughs> we didn't go together, but he beat me. But he said this, thank you so much for standing and encouraging me. I couldn't have done it without you. Here Beth started strong, but she had trouble around mile 23, and she reached the final straightaway at 2 <coughs> 243, she had two minutes left to qualify. 200 yards away from the finish, she stumbled and she fell. Dazed, she stayed down for 20 seconds. And the crowd said, get up, get up. The clock was ticking. 2.44, less than a minute to go. Beth Ann, she staggered to her feet and she began walking. And then five yards away from the finish line, guess what? She fell again. Five yards. She began to crawl. The crowd was cheering her on. And she crossed the finish line on her hands and feet. What was her time? Two hours, 44 minutes, and 57 seconds. She made it. Beth Ann's training, her willpower, gave her the endurance that she needed to finish. So I want to tell you that story. Because I believe in the Christian walk, but walking through life with Christ, we find we need a similar type of training. And we need some willpower to make it through life. Life, just because you come, become a Christian, doesn't mean it's all a, a bed of roses. doesn't mean that life goes perfect. It means that we need training and we need willpower to make it through. Because we all have temptations. We all have obstacles and struggles that would cause us sometimes to just kind of stray away. To give up on our faith. And it's in those times where we do need to have that training, that willpower, and our own, our own resources to help us to pull through. It's our time in God's Word. It's our time in prayer that helps us to stand firm. And so every moment that you spend with the Lord, whether it's in prayer or it's in the Word, it's a benefit to you to help you that when those struggles and those times come, that you'll stay on track. But praise God, it says that it's not just up to you and I. It says that the Holy Spirit gives us the ability and the help to stand firm so that we won't have to face the struggles of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 1.21 says this, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. I want you to underline two things. It's God who makes. God does it. Does what? Underline this. You stand firm. For Christ. Instead of letting us stumble all over the place and let us waver, God empowers us to keep our commitment to Christ. He's with us to guide us. He's with us to encourage and strengthen us and sometimes rebuke us so that we will stand firm in our commitment to Christ. See, I have a responsibility as a believer in Christ. You have a responsibility as a believer in Christ to grow in your spiritual walk. You need to grow into maturity, grow into Christ-likeness. That is our part. We have to do that. And I need those resources personally to resist the opposition that may come to my faith. I must rely on not only my sources, but God's sources. I find that if I try to do things on my own, I'm bound to fail. But if I trust in God to see me through, you know what? You're going to be successful. It's God and I, it's you and God, working hand in hand. But He has set us apart. He has given me, or He has given me the ability to stand firm. Here's the second thing God has done. God has set me apart for His service. He set me apart for His service. Verse 21 ends with the second thing that God has given us. It says, God anointed us. As I said earlier, it was customary uh, for the Old Testament to anoint kings and to anoint prophets and priests as they begin their process to what God's called them to do. They were being consecrated. They were being set apart for the duties that God had called them to do and it was chosen for them. 
But what we see in the Old Testament is kind of it's a shadow of what's to come. The Old Testament shadow, shadows anticipated the, the spiritual anointing that was coming for those who were in Christ. And all those who were in Christ, as the Bible describes as the anointed, anointed one, us ourselves as, as believers and in Christ, guess what? You're anointed because of your union with Christ. This anointing of the Holy Spirit involves the Spirit's indwelling within our hearts and it empowers us for ministry. <laughs> Listen to these two verses. Ephesians 3.16 says, I pray that out of His glorious riches, underline this, He may strengthen you with power. And circle the word power. Through His Spirit. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to, so at least two words, His power, that is at work within us. See, in both of these verses, both, both of these cases, God's Word is telling us that, that our anointing results in an empowerment to accomplish what? What He's called us to do. See, if God has called you to be a preacher, if He's called you or set you apart to be a preacher, He's going to give you the giftedness to preach. He's going to give you the empowerment to preach. If God sets you apart as a teacher, He's empowered you and will give you the gifts to help you teach. If He's called you to be a caregiver, He will help you and give you the empowerment to be a, a to show mercy. If He has called you to be a leader, He's going to give you the empowerment to lead. So God empowers and anoints us that He's going to give us special gifts to make sure that we can accomplish through this power to accomplish what He's called us to do. See, right now, in this moment, God is looking into your heart and He's looking into my heart and He's wondering if we receive and act upon the anointing that He gives to us. <coughs> Friends, church life is more than just here. I am so glad that you're here this morning. I'm glad you're here to worship. But being a believer involves so much more than here. Let me say this. It's not just our church, but every church. Every church, I believe, has the desire to grow. Grow in faith in Christ. Grow in numerically. We want to reach people. Is that your heart's desire? I believe we all want to see his church, the church right here, the new Unical Baptist Church grow. I think that's the desire of a lot of churches. But let me say this. Every church cannot grow beyond what care they can give. I remember um, at a fairly large church, we started AIM groups. AIM groups were basically, uh, we had 21 of them. And we divided up the church and, and people, if they came in new, all of a sudden they had people pull them in. What we were doing was instead of having just the, the paid staff being the ones to care, we, we gave it all away. And guess what? We grew, not only numerically, but in days of Christ. Then we stopped with our groups. Guess what happened? weren't growing. Then we started groups again a little bit later. Guess what happened? We started to grow because our care expanded for more people. And I believe this is one of the most caring churches I've ever been a part of. And that's what we need to do. Everybody has to say, okay, God, you set me apart to do something in your church, to care for someone, to reach out to someone. And I believe that that is our heart's desire. So let me ask you a couple questions. What is your ministry here what, what is your ministry? What are you doing using gifts to accomplish what he's called you to do? What are the fruits of your labor? Uh, he's called every one of us. He set us apart through his anointing. He set you apart. Now let me say this. I'm not the only minister here. When I look out, we're all ministers of Jesus Christ. We all have different things God's called us or set us apart to do. But we all should be a part of the grand thing that God is doing through your ministry and mine together to grow the great church. So what are you doing? What is your ministry? Think about that. Because God has set the apart of Here's the next thing. God has placed his seal of ownership upon me. How many of you have ever sent a package or a letter to a place or a person and it never got there? 
Anybody? Okay, if you have. I, I was with my son Trent, and uh, his phone, by the way, I won't tell you uh, what company it was, but his phone uh, did not work, so they sent a box and sent a little package so that we could send his phone back. Now, Verizon, um, I'm sorry, no, I wanted to do that first. But Verizon, they sent their package thing, they put it on there, and Trent took it down, and he put it in a drop box with a mailbox, post office. Well, about three months later, I get a bill that says $410 for the phone. So I called him and says, we sent, I was with him when he put that phone in. Well, what happened is he put this box in a post office mailbox when it was to go to UPS. It happens a lot. So we went, he went and walked with Oklahoma and said, hey, we put this box in. It could have been UPS. What's going on? They said, oh, it happens all the time. We take that box and we have a special place for it and we send it right away to go to UPS and go to what's going on. You know what? Today, it's been almost two years. Has that made it there? <laughs> I would suggest anytime you need to make sure that someone goes somewhere, whether it's a letter or a package, that you have them put their seal and guarantee that it's going to get there to that person or place. Register it. Get the stamp of approval that they're going to put it and get it to the right hand. <coughs> See, that's what you got to do. In the days of slavery, it was, it was not unusual for a slave owner to put their seal or perhaps even a tattoo on the slaves so they know who they belong to. You think of important documents. It's a seal. It's a, it's a witness there. If I set my seal, it's kind of the phraseology that's come down from the old English. Now listen, 2 Corinthians 1.22. God has set his seal of ownership upon us. See, the Holy Spirit has branded us, has, has sealed us, has marked us as His own. He's claimed you as His property. He owns you. He owns me. The moment we give our life to Jesus Christ, He sets His seal on our lives. Listen to Ephesians 1, 3, 13. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, underline the rest of the verse. Having believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So God can look down and he, he can see for sure and identify those who are His and He knows those who are not His. It's like we're wearing God's uniform when we're involved by the Holy Spirit. He identifies us and He acts appropriately towards us with His seal of ownership that He's placed upon us. What does that mean? That means that we'll never be lost, friends. We will be delivered safely into His hand. Somebody say amen. amen. We are guaranteed that we will be placed in his place no matter what's going on in our life. Here's the next thing. God has given me a guarantee for the future. I have a guarantee for the future. Here's three verses that basically say the same thing. 2 Corinthians one twenty two says, God has put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.5 5 says, Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And then Ephesians 1.13 and 14. When you believed in Christ, He identified you as His own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom He promised long, uh, long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that He will give us everything He promised. And that he has purchased, that purchased us to be here. Now, when I bought a home, like many of you have done, just bought a home here back May 23rd, we put a deposit down for the house, just like you have. That deposit says, here's a down payment, but I want you to know that there'll be more money coming. And we get set up for payments, and then every month we make that payment to pay it off. See, God has put his deposit in our hearts in the person of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit in our possession, meaning there is more to come. That's a great thing. See, when you buy something, usually you put it on installment, you can back out if you want to. You know, say, oh yeah, I put it there, but I won't back out. God doesn't back out. God has purchased you with His blood. God has put a deposit down on your life and my life, guaranteeing that those who are in Christ will be delivered safely. 
Our souls are in escrow, waiting until that final day of redemption. See, God promises great things for our future. He promises, and the Holy, the Holy Spirit that indwells us is that evidence or guarantee of what's to come and what God has promised us. See, there are so many benefits as Christians. I'm glad for the benefits. But God says this is just the beginning. This is the first installment about what's to come. I say this in conclusion. When author Stephen King was unknown, he was 24 years old. He was a school teacher. He was living in a trailer with his wife and his two kids. He sold short stories to a magazine just to make ends meet. One of the pieces was especially really hard for him to write. It dealt with worlds of girls, which he didn't know anything about. Over and over, he tried to wrestle with the words to put them on the page, but it, it just didn't gel. And he had eight pages that he just took and he watered them up and he threw them out in the trash. That night, his wife Tabitha happened to notice the paper as she was taking out the trash, and so she was curious. She opened them up and she read the incomplete story. Seeing the potential immediately, she insisted, I want you to finish this. And he says, he says, I told her too long that it's not the market I'm trying to sell. I says, it might turn out to be a short novel. She says, just write it. He says, but I don't know anything about girls. And she says, well, and she helped him for many, many years. King finished his book. Doubleday was willing to pay only $2,500 in advance because they didn't know if people, how they would respond to what he wrote. Well, the publishers didn't need to worry because Carrie became a national bestseller and also a rock electric motion picture. I say that because there's another king. There's another king who rescues unfinished stories from the trash, which is where many of us throw our lives when we don't like what we've written, when we can't make things go the way that we want, when we don't see the, the prospect of anything good coming out of it. We feel insecure, we feel inferiority, we lack confidence. And just when it seems nobody knows or cares about the struggles we're going through, Jesus reaches down, scoops up our crumpled dreams, and he gently smooths out the crumpled remnants and our abandoned hopes. And he sees beyond the sometimes anguish attempts that we've made to make sense of our world and our place in it. See, he knows the potential that lies just past our fatigue and our defeat. And when I'm willing, and when you're willing, he hands back our life and he says, finish the story. You're under my anointing. You can stand firm. I've set you apart. I've placed my seal upon you, and I guarantee your future. And all that is left is for you and I to recognize who we are in Christ. And you know what? No one can hold us back. In Christ, I am, you are, his anointing. You feel inadequate? You feel a lack of confidence? Through Christ, we should know that we are empowered and have the ability to do all these things to do. He's given us the ability to stand for it. He has set us apart for a service. He has his stamp of ownership on us, and I'm thankful for the guarantees of our future. My question to you is more than simply, are you in Christ? I've heard it this way said, maybe you've heard this before. When we stand before God, I, I think there'll be two questions. One, did you know my son Jesus? And two, what did you do for him? Why did he ask that question? Because through Christ, we're anointed to do something greater than it's just us. He has anointed us for a purpose and a plan. And in Christ, you're anointed to build a kingdom. You've been given the power and authority to go and build as ministers of Jesus Christ. So, what are they going to do for you? How can you make a difference? Friends, it's just one person, one thing at a time. And in Christ, you are his anointing. And there's nothing 
that you can't do. Let us stand together. Sing number 497 from the closing song. Do you know that? Maybe you're working 